Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Megan Stringer, SE, Associate Principal at Homes about embodied carbon reduction and the SE 2050 Commitment Program. I'm your co-host, Matt Cardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Megan. This episode is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE structural exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE structural exam the first time. PPI's PE structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE structural books. PPI's live online course includes hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all of the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Megan, welcome to the show. We are so happy to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we've already given you a brief introduction, but can you tell us a little bit in your own words on what you do on a day-to-day basis? Sure. Yeah, I guess, you know, like most of your listeners, I'm a practicing structural engineer. I I guess specifically have been working on our our company's uh, corporate campus work. So a lot of tech campus work. I've pretty much spent my whole career at, at homes working on like two two main projects that have kind of each spanned about five plus years. Um, so in that experience, I've been able to do uh, more recently a bunch of mass timber work, which has been super exciting. And then uh, I guess of late, doing a lot of multifamily residential that's also using mass timber. And I, and I really do see multifamily residential kind of being a really great sweet spot for, for, for mass timber. Um, but I guess maybe a bit unique is, uh, I guess, aside from that kind of day-to-day work of structural engineering, I've been pretty involved uh, my whole professional career in various professional organizations. So um, I've gotten super involved when I moved to the Bay Area in the local SEA, which is Fionc out here in California where I practice. Um, you know, I got involved right away in the kind of sustainable design committee. I guess I was always kind of drawn to like passive strategies and how just something as simple as how you locate your building on a site can really make an impact on its energy performance, for example. Anyway, yeah, just kind of got involved and that eventually led me to to SEI, the SEI world and and the sustainability committee there. They were just doing a lot of great work and I probably got involved, I don't know, seven to eight years ago now. And um, yeah, I guess that kind of led me to my current leadership position back at Seonk uh, as, as vice president. So it's been kind of, yeah, it's been really exciting. A lot of, a lot of great, uh, met a lot of great people along the way. And really, I think just being involved in those organizations has just given, given so much back to my career. Um, it, it's, it's just led me to a lot of great opportunities. Yeah, that's awesome. I I want to follow up on that uh, later when we kind of get into the career sections, because I think that's very sure. important. Uh, uh, but I did want to dig deeper a little bit into uh, embodied carbon reduction. Uh, but before we start on that, can you explain to our listeners that aren't too familiar with it what embodied carbon is and why it's important? Sure. So I guess uh, since I work in the building building world, we'll kind of focus on on that for the the definition. But it's it's very relatable for any infrastructure type project or anything else that you're you're working on. But um. So when we talk about an environmental impact of a building, we're talking about there's there's two things. It's either the operational impact or the embodied impact. And so kind of the embodied carbon portion of that is really just, it's really meant to be kind of the sum of, uh, they equate it to greenhouse gas emissions kind of related, uh, or sorry, released during the life cycle of a building for pretty much all the phases except that operational phase, which would be that, that operational impact. So it's really just uh, accounting for all of the environmental impacts that go into everything from raw material extraction to manufacturing those raw materials to our structural materials, any of the transportation impacts, you know, to site, um, the construction impacts that that um, maintenance and any end of life uh, impacts is kind of all kind of considered in that embodied carbon. So that, if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, I guess why that's important is obviously as a structural engineer, we have a really big influence over the amount of materials that we specify and, and what types and the quantities. 
and therefore that that directly relates to to your building's uh, embodied carbon. And so uh, buildings account for a very large portion of global CO2 emissions, and therefore uh, embodied carbon's just been much more front and center of late, given that that kind of operational piece of that, uh, that pie of a building's impact has come down a lot over the last you know, few decades um, as uh, you know, architects and MEP engineers have really focused on you know, reducing the, the em emissions uh, operational side of, of that uh, piece, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, seems... that makes total sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, so I guess to clarify, Basically, the operational is when the building's built, and that's where the architects, MEP, they've been doing that for uh, recently or, or throughout the years, I think, through like lead certifications and whatnot. And uh, structural engineers kind of haven't been really involved in that, but now it's we, we're trying to get involved and trying to do our part. And our part comes into, uh, I think, when we're, is it when we're specifying or telling them what, I guess, uh, some of the specs to reduce uh, when they're building it or when they're producing like the concrete or the steel, uh, we can do our part in that to reduce the embodied carbon to reduce the carbon footprint. Is that, am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, I think specifications is such like low hanging fruit there and, and how we specify and consider specifying things differently. Or for example, with concrete, you know, probably the lowest hanging fruit is specifying more cement replacement in your concrete mixes is gonna have a really huge impact on the embodied carbon of the structure. There's other strategies as, uh, you know, utilizing less material when you can. So whether that's like, if you typically would build something with a mild steel concrete slab, you could consider using post-tensioning to kind of thin up material or castellated or voided, uh, you know, beam systems, things like that, like waffle slabs, things like that, that, um, there's just strategies that can uh, help reduce that embodied carbon. And so it really just gets down to um, a big part is probably specifications, like using less material. I think uh, it's an interesting discussion in kind of where I practice in a high seismic region of like resilience and performance-based design and designing your building, you know, to, to potentially be better than the code minimums. And so how does that play into, into that, that whole embodied carbon piece because while you may be specifying a little bit more material up front, if you kind of take that over the life cycle of your structure and in that, you know, we're likely going to see a relatively large earthquake in the next 20, 20 years in, in the Bay Area, um, you know, if you don't have to tear down your building after one, one seismic event, you know, that's obviously saving a lot on embodied carbon. So there, there's a lot of different um, ways that you can look at that, but I definitely think specifications is probably one, some of the lowest hanging fruit out there. And and then really trying to understand, yeah, our essentially our material quantities and what, what we're specifying in, in our structures or potentially even using lesser impactful materials, for example, like a mass timber um, when you can or when that makes sense. No, and that's really great, especially since, um, and you'll have to forgive me. So I'm, I'm originally from Alabama and I did some, worked in a design firm there and you know, I'm currently in Texas now. And it's very interesting about the reducing this embodied carbon, like the, the topic um, is spreading throughout the industry, but I think for a couple of years, it was very jurisdictional. So you mm -hmm. had, of course, California as a, as a early adopter on a lot of these things. So when you're talking about, you know, reduced embodied carbon in construction and in these materials and where, you know, structural engineers can really take hold. I know you say concrete and, you know, specifications are very low hanging fruit, but do you think that's like a really good starting place, especially for people who are trying to adopt with their current jurisdictional requirements? Yeah, I, I, I think we all can start there, uh, in a specification standpoint, I think, um, you know, having been a little bit a part of kind of the Marin County low carbon concrete code, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that, but that was kind of the first in the US. Um, it uh, went, went active, I think it's been over almost two years now, but um, within that code, it was very, it was very regional specific, so very specific to the Bay Area. And they, there was a big study done and they looked at kind of the NRMCA industry average, which could be, um, you know, tailored to different geographical locations, for example. And 
they, you know, chatted with a lot of the local um, suppliers to kind of see and, and set, set targets and, and reduction targets and essentially kind of a, a global warming potential target for concrete or, or, or cement, um, cement uh, target uh, for, for those mixes. And so I do think um, those kinds of things can be looked at, but need to be looked at kind of on a region, regional basis. And you shouldn't just take the value from the Bay Area and use them and wherever you're located. They should definitely be considering, you know, your local local uh, production and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that that's a place to start. I think you could also look at something called uh, environmental product declaration. So those are essentially a life, it's, it's, they're like a third party verified um, LCA on specific products. And so products, for example, could be specific concrete mixes, for example, just to talk about concrete, but there's a lot for steel as well. And, and pretty much all structural, all the major structural materials have, have environmental product declarations. And I think the intention of those are, you know, right now it's really just trying to get more manufacturers to create those for their products. So then we as a structural engineer, could look at the impact of, let's say, this 4,000 PSI concrete mix versus another 4,000 PSI concrete mix and start to make decisions based on embodied carbon. Um, and so, you know, if we're meeting our structural requirements, um, you would essentially just have more data, one more metric that you can use in, in decision making. So I think um, we're starting to see more environmental product de declarations come, out, come on the market. Um, there's definitely a lot of industry average, but also starting to see a lot more manufacturer specific as well. I think it's something that, you know, if you're you're new to kind of the, the sustainability world and, and what you can do as a structural engineer, those are kind of good good places to start um, to start looking and really just start to consider or try to start tracking um, your material quantities of your of your projects. And and you know that's kind of the whole point of, of life cycle assessment. And I think uh, yeah just just getting started I think is is helpful. And, and obviously you'll probably not not be doing it so great in the beginning, but you're going to start refining that and you're going to be starting to, to track track those quantities um, much more accurately and much more consistently, you, but you got to start somewhere. Yes, yeah, so it looks like uh, a lot of these third party uh, uh, vendors or I guess the, they're essentially making another statistic, like you were saying, to uh, track the embodied carbon inside these. And then hopefully I think it looks like as an industry, we want to get that started. And so if that's something that's important to us, to the client and and to the architect as, and whoever's using the building as well, maybe that could start being more of a, I, I guess a, a feature that a lot more and more uh, manufacturers will will start doing. And hopefully that can kind of just be incorporated in the, in the overall uh, embodied carbon to basically to reduce it and that leads me to like the SEI. Uh, I know you're part of the SEI sustainability committee. I think you're the co-chair. And uh, you're, they have that structural engineers 2050 uh, commitment program. Uh, can you tell us more about that program and how that is going to, it aims to help reduce the embodied carbon? Yeah. Yeah, I guess one last point on just those EPDs or environmental product declarations, I think. Um, even right now, you could just start to add add language to your specifications that say to submit an, an EPD if you have it. And so it's not even a requirement, but I think it's just starting to get that the word out there on that. But anyway, yeah, on SEI. So I guess technically I just turned off as co-chair of the sustainability committee. I've been a part of that for, I don't know, seven, seven, eight years now. Um, and they, the, the way that that committee works is it's just a, I, there was a three-year chair chairship term and and uh, my colleague and I, we just turned off in October, so it's only about a month. But yeah, within that, uh, it's been so great to see the, uh, what we call just the SE 2050 uh, commitment program, yeah, really take off. And it kind of started actually as an idea within the Carbon Leadership Forum. And they, within the Carbon Leadership Forum, they were really interested in this idea of trying to get to net zero embodied carbon by 2050. And so kind of very much paralleling off the AIA and their 2030 you know, challenge and commitment, um, they, uh, CLF was working on, on, on that idea. So they were incubating that idea kind of at that same time. This was probably back in 2019. They had kind of approached the SEI Sustainability Committee with, with the idea and really thinking that it would be great to have an organization like SEI 
uh, developed the US's commitment program. And so I think it was in summer of 2019 that the Carbon Leadership Forum issued a challenge to the structural engineering profession to um, reduce embodied carbon in all projects by 2050. And then it was, I guess, officially in December of that year that SEI kind of Board of Governors officially endorsed kind of the challenge. And maybe that was when we were officially able to kind of start developing that, that commitment program within SEI Sustainability Committee. And so, yeah, it's been a lot of great, a lot of hard work, a lot of really passionate people involved in, in kind of the subcommittee getting SE 2050 up and running. And we officially launched the commitment program in November 2020, so just uh, just over a year ago. And it's just been so amazing to see just the amount of uh, engagement we've gotten from the profession. So to date, I just checked this morning, we have 68 firms committed to structural engineering firms. We've had over 30 projects submitted to kind of our embodied carbon database and um, over 30 um, in, uh embodied carbon action plans received. And so I'll kind of explain what that is. So essentially we wanted to create a commitment program for structural engineering firms that really required people, uh, firms to, to do something. And so it's pretty very low, low bar of entry to enter the commitment program. And we kind of did that intentionally because we wanted to appeal to, to all firms all over, all across the country. Um, and so there's really only three requirements. So the first is to get a letter from your firm leadership um, saying that you're gonna to commit to the program and meet the program requirements. And there's templates on the website for you to download. So it's very easy to create that letter, but we really wanted to have buy off from your firm leadership. And then within the first six months, you need to create what we call an ECAP or Embodied Carbon Action Plan. And these ECAPs are publicly available. So you can go look at all the ones up on the website. They're actually a really interesting read to kind of hear what all different firms are doing. Uh, so that is within the first six months and that ECAP is supposed to be updated annually. Um, and so like, you know, if you didn't get there to certain things that you said that you do, that's okay. Um, I think it's just really great to see just the transparency and see, see what firms are doing. I think it's really interesting and, and seeing how much the industry is just sharing with everyone just to better, to better ourselves and, and the profession. And then the third requirement is to submit a certain amount of building uh, embodied carbon data to a central database. And so it's uh, typically two, two projects to five projects. It depends on how big your company is. Um, but so again, kind of a, a low number, obviously if you wanted to submit more, that would be great. And we'd love for firms to be tracking this kind of data on all their projects, but for to, to, to meet the requirements is really just that. And so I do see those evolving over time as we get to, 2050, but for now, um, the intention is for it to be relatively, you know, low bar of entry. We realize people aren't that familiar with uh, these kinds of concepts, and uh, we really want to kind of help up, upscale the whole the whole industry. Um, I do really think if we don't start to take this on and take on embodied carbon, you know, our likely architects are going to start doing this for us, and I, I really don't see. I just really see that as, as a concern and something that the industry or our profession really should be taking seriously because, you know, I've, I've had some many conversations with architects where they're already trying to, you know, want to dictate stuff in our concrete mixes and I, and I don't think we want to, I don't think we want to get be there uh, as a profession with, with uh, architects dictating that for us. So that's essentially the, the program in a nutshell. We have been trying to create a lot of resources for, for firms out there who are you know, very new on their embodied carbon journey. And so definitely check out um, the SE 2050 website. It's just se2050.org. Also check out the SEI Sustainability Committee website, which is just seisustainability.org. Um, just two really great resources that have a lot of great webinars about um, you know, how to reduce embodied carbon. There's a lot of great resources up there. There's a very, there's a lot of tools. Anyway, just a lot of really great information to check out um, for people who, yeah, are very early on in their embodied carbon journey. I think can find a lot of good information. And just to confirm those two websites that you just stated, um, that is where you can find these templates for the ECAPs. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's the there's a template for kind of your firm commitment letter. There's a template for your embodied carbon action plan. It's interesting. There's um, a lot of firms have taken in and like really endorsed 
um, or just really gotten on board with this idea and engaged their marketing teams to kind of come up with these really beautiful looking plans. But there's also plenty of firms that are just even, we have a Google form that you can just fill out, fill out your uh, uh, answers and uh, that's your ECAP for the year. And so I think it's, you know, everything from that and in between. And it's, that's been really cool just to see. And so I have a quick question for you, because likely you mentioned you've already had around 68 firms submit their ECAPs already. And I'm just kind of curious, especially when plans like this come about, there's almost a level of imagination that you have to have because it's not something that's regularly asked or hasn't been regularly asked of the structural engineering community. So what is the most creative Thing that you've seen in an ECAP on how an engineering firm has reduced their uh, embodied carbon? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I guess just to clarify, we've had 68 firms committed, but maybe only half of them have committed uh, their ECAP. So there's only about a little over 30 right now. But I think, I, I guess our firm, I guess we just submitted a few months ago. And you know, I've, I've been pretty involved in the structural sustainability, you know, industry for a really long time now. And I will say it was difficult to write. And, you know, I was kind of the main author. I definitely have some help within my, my firm. But just to kind of, I think just forcing you to put, put down in words what you as a firm are going to commit to do and knowing that it's going to be public and, and out there, like you, you obviously, you think about it a little bit more and you're like, what am I, what am I agreeing to commit to? Uh, what's really realistic? And, you know, we're, we're pretty early on in our embodied carbon journey. So I think um, it was it was great to read, you know, firms like a Walter P. Moore or Arab or Thornton Tomasetti that have kind of been in this space a lot longer and more um, more well established in their kind of, you know, tracking of embodied carbon data already on their projects. I think it was just it was just great to, I don't know, just kind of learn what they're doing. And, you know, some some firms already have like little databases going and and, you know, ways that they can kind of track. Uh, how they're doing for projects, but you know, we're we're obviously or at, at my company, we're still very early on in our journey, and so it's it, it's just uh, inspiring to kind of see what people are doing, and to um, I don't know, just help get some little tidbits from 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 the different companies out there. I'm like, oh hey, they're starting a a group that's discussing you know X topic monthly. Like that's a great idea. I think we should try and consider doing that. Or you know, if they're putting out case studies, like I think Arab has a case study in there. So I think it's a really great and interesting. And you can, if you're working in that same kind of area, and you're like, oh, well, hey, for, for that project, they were able to target whatever, 70% cement replacement in their foundations. Like that's really cool and great to know. And I think just arms you better for kind of discussions on your current project. So that's uh, what I've been loving about these action plans. And I would definitely encourage you guys to go kind of check them out and, and read a few because they're, they're really interesting. Thanks for that, Megan. Uh, I, I remember you mentioned life cycle uh, assessment earlier. Could you go a little more into that and, and what that is? Yeah. So a life cycle assessment is essentially just, um, you can think of it as just environmental accounting. So it's accounting for all the inputs and outputs that go into a product. And the product in our case is, is a building. And so it's, again, talking about all the environmental impacts from just raw from everything from raw material extraction through transportation, construction, um, you know, building being utilized as accounted for and then kind of an end of life impact. So it's, it's really kind of the, just the life cycle of, of a building is, is what's uh, accounted for in a life cycle assessment. And so they are typically based on a, a building life assuming like 60 years is, is the typical like uh, length that a, that a life cycle assessment is, is based on. And um, yeah, and it's, uh, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Gotcha, yeah, and I think where we play our part in is, uh, it would probably be the beginning of the life cycle, yeah. right, just to build it. And if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, we as the structural engineers would have a large part, uh, ideally in the specifications, um, what type of concrete, what mixes, what's going into the, the steel and the fabrication uh, just to build that. And so during that whole life cycle assessment, we take a big uh, part uh, ownership of building it and the materials to, to do that. But then later on, that's the operational phase, I'm assuming. And then that's how we can kind of see how the whole carbon, uh, embodied carbon is uh, affecting the whole building then, right? Is that 
my on track yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, a whole building LCA encompasses everything. So we as structural engineers would want to be a part of the LCA for the structure itself. So basically what you would have to do as a structural engineer is essentially just calculate your quantity of material. So your tonnage of rebar, your cubic yards of concrete, um, your tonnage of steel um, or mass timber or concrete. Uh, so it's essentially just, just tracking those material quantities and reporting that into an LCA software. And that'll give you your overall uh, environmental impact for your building. So yeah, I think we have a big portion to play in, in, the, in the life cycle. Um, in terms of you know steel tonnage like if you're designing steel building how much steel do you have in your structure is there ways that you can reduce that or use steel that are that's less impactful from a certain plant versus another and that's kind of where those environmental product declarations can come in handy because you can easily see um, which steel steel plant has has more impactful uh, for example um, you could impact your structure or the, the embodied carbon based on, uh, you know, using mass timber in lieu of concrete or steel for, for a particular building, if it makes sense. And so with that, you know, you're usually getting a, a slightly lighter structure. And, you know, that usually has less foundations, less lateral system, depending on where you're practicing. And, and so again, reducing, reducing materials and reducing embodied carbon. No, that's great. And you know, you've mentioned kind of mass timber a lot, which I know is a hot topic in the industry. Mm -hmm. And you've hinted that you've been working on uh, two big projects. And I think one of those big projects was, is it the largest mass timber building in North America? Um, Technically. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I know there's larger buildings in design, but I think we'll, we'll hold our title maybe for a little bit longer. Um, yeah, that was... <laughs> It's been a, a great project that's very much like a labor of love um, uh, for about five, six years of, of uh, the last, yeah, five or six years. And um, yeah, I, I mean, the project just kind of encompassed everything. You know, we started design on it back in 2015. So Mass Timber was still relatively new to the U.S. and definitely new, newer to the, the Bay Area where it was constructed. And I think, you know, it, it just, there were a lot of lessons learned out of that Um some of which like aren't lessons learned anymore because things have, have evolved or there's been so much more mass timber projects since then. But, you know, at the time it was, um, yeah, it was just a lot of challenges around procurement, you know, trying to procure that much timber at one time because we not only had cross laminated timber panels, but also glue lamp columns. And it was just a very large uh, percentage of, of the market at the time. Um, it, it, is, it is a bit unique in that it's a composite uh, cross laminated timber floor with concrete. And so we are relying on composite action between both to, to achieve our spans and to uh, be able to accommodate the, the loading that we have. Uh, there's a pretty big, heavy green roof um, on, on this building. So it is supporting, you know, in places up to like four or five feet of soil and trees and all of that. Um, I think it was interesting because back at the time, you know, we were looking at a bunch of different masking strategies for the building. So whether it was going to be like a taller, um, taller structure, which I think was more common then, but what kind of program won out was this very large contiguous floor plate, um, very low rise. So it's, not, it's primarily only a two-story structure and the wood really lent itself well, well to that. And I think the wood and the renderings just kind of captured the owner's, owner's heart and we were able to keep that in, in the project, even though it definitely came at a bit of a premium. I think another thing that really helped us on that project was uh, integrating a lot of the MEP into the, into, the, into the concrete topping slab, since it was composite anyway. So we did rely on that to, to house a lot of conduit um, and radiant tubing. And so I think given that it was doing double duty, it was uh, less, less likely to kind of get VE'd out of the project. And so... Yeah, that was just a, a big success. I think another obviously main reason for um, the client going with Mass Timber was uh, from the embodied carbon side. So really wanting to tell a strong sustainability story and um, using a, a material that has a lot less embodied carbon from, you know, the alternate concrete or steel structure that we would have built. And you know, I think you can see up to a third of the impact uh, of like a concrete or steel structure with mass timber. You know, that's not always the case. And I'm not trying to say that the other materials aren't great because, you know, this was very much a hybrid building with uh, that, that composite CLT floor sitting on steel wide 
with beams, with glue limb columns, and we had concrete shear walls for our lateral system. So really a hybrid in, in, in the true sense of that, that term. And, you know, I think all of those materials did great for what they were and for that project and for that client and that solution. And it, it, it turned out to be just a, a beautiful finished product and uh, yeah, worked out really well. And so, you know, I do think mass timber will be a big part of the piece as we try and get to reducing embodied carbon of our structures, um, you know, and, and I think the flip side of that is, as I'm sure you might be aware, but there's just been a lot of talk in the industry with mass timber and how that could potentially change, you know, change the game on how buildings get built, you know, really trying to leverage the pre-manufactured nature of the product and integrate a lot of the MEP systems in with the floor system and trying to have these larger pieces come out to site and get, get uh, you know, constructed or erected. So I don't know, we'll see where that all goes, but it's, it's been a lot of interesting discussions around, around mass timber. But um, yeah, it was, it was a great project, a great team, and just, you know, obviously a lot of, a lot of hard work, uh, but super rewarding and, and yeah, just a, a great finished product. Yeah, and I have one, one question about that yeah. because everyone is kind of curious around, you know, mass timber, its sustainability and ethics, as well as like, there's really, it, it has a high prevalence in Europe and Canada, mm -hmm. like mass timber is, you know, more prevalent in those areas. And it's now being newly introduced uh, here in the United States. And everyone's like, this is a shiny, new, exciting <laughs> um, product and we want to use it. Everyone's really excited about it. But a lot of times, you know, people don't feel comfortable moving forward with a new product unless there are case studies because they want to see that it has worked on another project first before they, you know, take the plunge and adopt it into their design. So do you know if this project that you worked on, do you know if there's any going to, going to be any case studies coming out of it, maybe specific to the reduced carbon impact or anything like that that will be published? Um, I hope so. You know, the, obviously when you deal with kind of tech, they're a little uh, want to be tight lipped on a lot of things. Um, but the project did just win a really big uh, committee on the environment award. So one of the AIA uh, code awards. And so I do hope that things get a little bit more public and a little bit more published and we can uh, get some, some stuff published. So I think we'll be seeing that. I think it'll just take a little bit of time uh, to, to kind of trickle, trickle out in, into the more common, uh, yeah, common knowledge. But um, yes, that, that is the goal. And so, you know, there, uh, we were trying to get a presentation at uh, the Mass Timber Conference, but the, those a couple years ago when that one kind of the first one that got canceled. Um, so I'm hoping uh, we'll be able to start to talk about it and and educate people that way too. So I, I do think you know, we'll be hearing more about it in, in the coming coming months. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Megan. I did want to end on a career advice question. Uh, I know you obviously had a very successful career and. A career that I, I know a lot of uh, young engineers would uh, aspire to. Uh, could you sh share any advice on 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 how to achieve success? I know, and maybe even touching upon all of the professional organizations that uh, you've joined and how that helped you. It seemed like that was a big part of um, uh, your career growth as well. Yeah, sure. And I guess maybe my advice would maybe stem from just you know, I don't know, get involved or find, find the thing that you're really passionate about and, and explore it. And, and I think uh, I've been just a, a pretty motivated person uh, throughout, I don't know, as a kid. And I think that's really helped me and kind of propelled me. Uh, but I think it's just been that getting involved and in doing something. And that doesn't need to be a professional organization. It, it can be. And I think you can find great fulfillment in that. But I think just yeah, finding that that thing that you love to do and do more of it. And I think you're, I don't know, that's how you're gonna wake up every day and, and enjoy what you do. And and in terms of how my involvement in just committees and getting involved in things that I was just interested in, I think, I don't know, just led to a lot of leadership opportunities to be able to like chairing a committee, to chairing a state committee, to joining a national committee, and then being involved in it, and then becoming a a co-chair of it. I think. It's, and then now like a vice president of a professional organization, I think it's just, you know, it, I find it, it's, it's interesting because it's just 
I don't know, they, they, this, this involvement has just given me so many opportunities, like opportunities to present at conferences, to work on projects and, you know, write a paper about that project and then go talk about that project and, and engage other structural engineers or architects. It, it, it's just been really fulfilling and really interesting. And then being able to, you know, leverage a lot of that skills and, and success from that standpoint, but also then within your own career and how you can start to help out your own firm and, and bring things that you're learning uh, with, you know, your colleagues to your own firm. I, it's just, it's been great. It's been so exciting and rewarding and, and you get to meet a lot of great people. I mean, our industry is so small and, and it's great to, you know, attend a national conference and, and know a couple people and be able to talk to them and catch up and I think that's just been, uh, it's just offered me so much and given me so much back that I, I would just, yeah, definitely, you know, just find that thing that yeah, that motivates you and, and go do it. And so I think that will, uh, you know, get, get you far, pretty far in life. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I, yeah, I just want to thank you. I think that's great career advice. Uh, I know uh, uh, even just joining uh, for me, it, it gives you a lot of opportunities to build, uh, not just your interests, but also your uh, maybe some of your soft skills, communication skills. Uh, I think it's kind of like low stakes project management. If you, if that's not something you do at, at your work, maybe if you want that experience, you can go lead a team of volunteers to, to do something that you're, you're really interested in. And uh, it, yeah, it's great to see that, how, how it's affected you throughout your career. And um, it, yeah, it may not be for everybody, but I highly encourage uh, if, if you want to go that down that route, it's, I think it's really beneficial. Yeah, you can host a podcast if you're so inclined. I mean, I just think that's so yeah. cool. There's just so many different things that you can do. And uh, it's great. It's just exciting. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I, I've learned a lot. We're going to link all of all of your uh, links that you mentioned uh, down below uh, for anyone to, to see. And yeah, I just want to thank you for being on the podcast and sharing uh, your knowledge with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been, been a lot of fun. Thank you, Megan. And we hope to hear from you again. I hope to see the case study open up at some point. <laughs> yes, I'll keep you posted. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, or any questions you may have. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 66, as well as any links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all your structural engineering endeavors.